short break so that the that there's a, um, some frame that I can cut into. So welcome everyone to our next lecture on machine learning. Today we continue with section three and I guess also section four. Let's first start with section three from logic to probabilities. Okay. Last time I said already I want to explain to you what exactly do we mean by p of a and p of a comma b. So this weird notation, right? It's weird notation when you switch on your mathematical brain because typically if p is a function how could it be once a function of one argument and then suddenly it's a function of two arguments. That's kind of weird. Also typically p of a is something else than p of b. That's also weird for us mathematicians, right? Because change of variable is always allowed, right? If you have a function f of x, yeah, like x squared or something. So let me show you. So if you have something, oh, this didn't work. So now it works. So if you have a function, um, you define a function f of x being equal to x squared, then immediately it's clear what we mean by f of 17, right? f of 17 then is 17 squared. We also know what we mean by f of a plus b, right? So that is a plus b squared. We also know what we mean by f of y, right? So that is y squared. So typically the f is some function and the variable that I put in here, the name doesn't matter. But with p of something, so here somehow those two are totally different things. So the notation is kind of weird, okay? And we try to make it more precise today. Yeah? Why am I doing it? Not because uh, you will really practically use this kind of, it's a bit theoretical what I show you today, but um, this doesn't work yet, so maybe I have to switch like this. Um, but ideally, sometimes there are some weird things, like you want to say, what is the probability of A being equal to 1, something like this also, maybe even something like that. So possibly a variable can also appear twice, and the question is, what is the meaning here, right? So what does it mean, right? And it, it will turn out that this will be 0, because those are like inconsistent statements, but how is this kind of motivated? And I show you how, to, how we could define the p of something in a simple manner, I think, but starting with propos propositional logic um, and only for finitely many variables. So not infinitely many variables, but only finitely many variables. And everything is nice, right? And then, of course, we can also do it for infinitely many variables. So for this, we define two things. We define syntax and semantics. So I studied mathematics and my specialization was mathematical logic, right? That's why we're going through this detail, because I really like it, but I think it's also essential for computer scientists. So let's just jump back. If you put your computer scientist hat on, suddenly it's not such a big deal, right? I mean, we call this overloading. Why is it simple, right? You could have two arguments for a function, you can have one argument, you might have different implementations, okay? That's no problem. And that's what we are doing here as well. So now what is the syntax and semantic thing? So that's something very basic you typically learn in a logic class, okay? And I just show you because, just to remind you that you might have learned it already, and if you haven't learned it or you hated it, maybe after this lecture you like it a little bit more, okay? So that would be already a success. So what is syntax? Syntax is all about defining strings valid strings, okay? So what strings are we allowed to write down when we want to write down formulas? And those are example strings, A, and then there's this new sign that we read as AND, or these are also all valid strings. The comma here is used to separate the strings. I omitted the quotation marks here, okay? So this is defining a language, and which is nothing more than a subset of all possible strings. And then there's the other part, there's the syntactic part, and then there's the semantic part. And the semantic part is what do these strings mean, okay? What do we denote by them? So these strings can be mapped to some real things, where real here now means I can assign each of these strings a truth value. So each of these strings is true or false, right? And those are the two things. Actually, as computer scientists, when you think about it, when you write a compiler, 
you need to specify the language, right, where you specify the syntax without giving it the meaning, where you have, and then you implement a parser that generates a parse tree from reading computer code. And that's exactly the same as we are doing it here, right? And then, once you have the parse tree, typically you have an interpreter or you have some evaluation function which then assigns semantics to it, okay? So the things totally make sense. So let's start with the propositional logic. Here's the syntax of propositional logic. So this looks long and complicated, but it's actually not. So typically we have an alphabet, which is basically just a set of symbols, okay? And so here are some symbols we want to use. In particular, we also want to use this round bracket close and open. Those are also symbols here. The comma here is not a symbol. And then we have these set v. So it's like a v or something, okay? So that is the set. It's a finite set here of symbols x, y, some other capital letters. We have 26 of them typically. Those are called non-logical symbols also. They're also called propositional variables, okay? So those will be like the initial variables from which we build up the larger formulas. And then we have junctors, which are the other symbols here. They are called logical symbols, sometimes also connectives. And those are basically names for truth functions. Okay, so that they are truth functions, actually that's like a preview, right? So that's like we are already um, giving away the climax. That has something to do with semantics. So we can just purely view them like that they are just some weird signs that we see on the wall. Okay, and then there are parentheses. They are for organizing stuff. Good, so this is defining basically the alphabet. And now comes the definition of what is a valid formula, or with other words, what strings are valid formulas, okay? And basically a formula A is a finite length string of symbols. And of course, the symbols must come from this alphabet here. So how do we start? We start by saying all symbols in our set of non-logical symbols, they are formulas already, okay? So these variables, kind of, they are already a formula when you write them down. And if you have two of them, you can construct new ones with these connectives, okay? And then basically we call this curly F here the set of all formulas. And note that this curly F is a subset of all possible strings, which we sometimes denote as these A to the power of star, okay? So that's typically how you write it. <coughs> and this now from this information, we could already write a parser, right, for this kind of stuff. By the way, note, so there's also a theory of formal grammars, which you might have heard already about in theoretical computer science. Then this F is actually a context-free language, or it also has some, it's type two in Chomsky's hierarchy. So just to make the connection to the other stuff that you might have learned. Um, the other interesting thing is this is an inductive definition. So inductive definition. So another example of an inductive definition are the natural numbers, right? Zero is a natural number, and if you have a natural number, then just plus one is another natural number, okay? And this is the symbols in V are formulas, and if you have already some, okay, then those are further formulas, okay? Good. Now, if you want to prove that something is a formula like A and B and C, kind of you have to go along these rules and, and show that this is all true, okay? You, so you start with ABC is a formula because they're coming from V, and then you would say A and B is a formula, and then A and B is a formula, and C is an also a formula, okay? So that's just it. Also, this thing is a formula, which is kind of strange with these brackets here, but if you just view it as a string, it's totally fine, okay? Good, so this is the syntax part. This allows us to write a parser. Um, next, let's go to the semantics part. And here now, the initial, the, the overall idea is we want to assign a truth value to all formulas. So how do we do it? We do it along the inductive definitions. So we will start with all the symbols in here, and give them a truth value. And then we explain for these um, more complicated formulas what their truth value is dependent on the truth values of A and B. Okay, great. So let's start with the variables here, these propositional variables. So we have these omega um, letter to use for Boolean assignment. Basically, a Boolean assignment is a mapping that maps each of these variable names. So they are just symbols onto truth values, and we are using zero and one. You could use any set of, um, uh, that has two elements. Zero and one is quite natural. You could also use the two strings true and false, 
or the real true and the real false, whatever, just a set of two elements. Good. And then we can now define for along the inductive definition for formulas, now we can assign them choose values. So it works like this. So the Boolean assignment, which was is defined for all the variables here, yeah, it will induce an assignment for all formulas, and this thing is typically called a choose function, Q, which is now going from the set of all possible formulas to 0, 1, yeah, as follows. First of all, if you have a propositional variable, you just assign it the omega of x, okay? And if you have a formula which looks like this, not a, you would say this is defined as 1 minus q of a. So where does the q of a coming from? It's coming from the already defined stuff, right? So a has been already defined, so we already have defined q of a. Possibly it's a propositional variable. So similarly, q of a and b can be defined to be just a product. So how does this work now? Product of truth values, how we cleverly choose these numbers. And with these numbers, the end can be nicely written like this, right? 0 times 1 is 0, 1 times 0 is 0, 1 times 1 is 1, okay? And if we have this string, now this is more difficult to pass, so this is q of, then starts the, stri the string bracket open a bracket close, that is the string we are talking about, and it should be just the same as q of a. Basically, brackets can be omitted, but they change the ordering how we basically organize our pass stream. Then there's q of a or b, and now this can be defined to be q of not, not a, and not b. These are De Morgan's laws. This is now just elegant, okay, because this has been already defined, so we can use it. And then there's also q of a arrow b, and that is just not a or b. Those are just other um, this is a mathematical definition of implication, yeah? Okay, that's just how it is. Um, and then further things, we say if q of a is equal to 1, we would say that the omega entails a, and we would write it like this. Don't worry, you can forget all of this once we have the nice formulas for probabilities. And as you know already, there are only two. There's the sum rule and the product rule, and that's our goal. But once and for all, we want to introduce this a bit more rigorously, and then after we've done it, we can throw away our ladder, okay? We don't have to worry about it anymore. But sometimes you have a complicated situation like that one, and then you need to look back maybe at how things are defined, whether this is zero or not, okay? Good. So don't worry too much. This won't change now into a, into a lecture of logic or something, but this is just how we could very precisely define these things. Let's switch to probabilities, okay? So logic has two things, syntax and semantics, and now basically we swap to probabilities. So there's these Boolean assignments, these omegas, okay? And we can talk about the set of these Boolean assignments, and this set of all possible Boolean assignments is called the sample space. So interesting, um, why are we so confident that all of this exists? because we are only talking about finitely many variables, then everything is great, okay? So if we would talk about infinitely many variables, things would be more cumbersome, right? So it would be less clear that such a set of all Boolean assignments of all functions kind of exists. It's always a bit strange if you have infinities here. We keep it simple, right? Because we just want to understand the structure, how the things work together. So when it's a finite set for n propositional variables, it would have two to the n elements, right? Why? Because there are two to the n bit strings, basically, that you could assign like my n variables. So, so far, so simple, I hope. So now a probability mass function is now a function that assigns each Boolean assignment, which is the mapping itself, okay, some number between 0 and 1. Okay, so the omega is a set of functions, and each of them kind of gives a weight. So basically, you could also view it each Boolean assumption, uh, each Boolean assignment represents a reality, okay? So for example, it could rain, and there could be clouds, so those are two propositional variables, and whatever, um, Borussia Dortmund will become the champion this next year or whatever, right? So this is a possible reality with a truth assignment, and there might be a different truth assignment to these statements, okay? So, and maybe one person has a certain probability mass function that assigns certain probabilities to the different possible outcomes of these 
propositional variables and another person has another one. So this probability mass function f could be something very subjective, okay, depending on what you believe about the world. So since it's a probability mass function, um, we want to have it that it has values between 0 and 1. That's arbitrary, right? It could be between 0 and pi if we enjoy it, right? Maybe there's a reason to do this. 0 and 1 is super simple. That's the usual way we, the usual numbers we use for probabilities. Then not so simple is that we want to have that if we sum up over this set of Boolean assignments, we want to have a 1. So that's then something we want to have the this, this situation that there are different realities, so different Boolean assignments, but one of them should be true, kind of, right? So if you sum them all up, kind of, it should be like a complete description of what can happen, okay? That's why it should sum up to one. Good, so far so good. The next notion we need is the notion of an event, and an event basically is a subset of this omega. Okay, so it's a subset of the sample space omega. By the way, the people who heard already measure theory or Wahrscheinlichkeitstheory 1, probability theory, they know this capital letter omega, right? And it's exactly the same one that you learned in those classes. However, I'm looking at a super simple finite case where everything is easy. And basically there's no strange results that it might not exist since it's a function of function and some other thing. Here everything is finite, everything is nice. And then we let the mathematicians do the work for infinities when things get more weird, okay? And it's possible, but more difficult, and we want to have it easy. So the important thing is an event is a subset of this, and um, how could you view it? Yeah, in a, in a way, basically, by having an event, that's kind of giving you facts, right? So, and it's basically ruling out certain Boolean assignments, okay? If Borussia Dortmund wins against Hertha BSC in, the, in some final, they are the winner, and this is now an effect. So the Boolean assignments that would have said otherwise, that some other, one, the other team will win, they are kind of sorted out, okay? That's why this set of the, the e, this event E is basically a set of Boolean assignments, but typically a subset of the whole sample space. Of course now, so all of those assignments sum up to one. Yeah, you see already where we are going. We could sum up all the Boolean assignments in E and by this assign a probability to the event E. Okay, however, but what does this have to do with logic and with these formulas we talked about? So each formula that we defined on the previous slides induces very naturally an event. And now using our super sophisticated notation, so the E sub A is defined to be the event set that is induced by the formula A. So what does it mean? It's a subset of all Boolean assignments which would make this formula true. Okay, so that's it. That's where we wanted to have this nice notation for here. And of course that is also a subset of omega. Um, curiously, different formulas can induce the same event, okay? So there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence here. So you could have a, a formula, for example, A and B, it has a certain event set, and the same will be B and A, right? Because there are like certain invariances in here. Also note that we can also write the sample space omega, which is also a subset of itself, mathematically speaking, by saying I want to have the event set of the formula A or not A. And A or not A is always true, okay? And for that reason, it will be everything. Good, so this is defining us now events. And now we can define the probability of an event, yeah, to just summing up the f of omegas that are in this event set. Okay, so that's it. So here we see already, so this, what we, what we write here, what we can write in here, basically must be some event. And then we cut, then we summing up all the probabilities for these sub elements of the event set. Okay, so that is what a probability of something means. So here there must be an event in here. Okay, um, okay. Since we also talked about formulas A and that they kind of naturally induce an event set, yeah, we can of course also define the probability of a formula A. Okay. That's why maybe sometimes people put formulas in P of something or, or a predicate like A being equal to 1 or whatever, X squared being equal to Y or whatever, yeah? So you can plug in anything here kind of that has a true statement 
And the reason why it's well defined is because there is an event set that corresponds to such a formula. And for all the event sets, we have defined it. So we have defined it for all formulas. OK? So far, so good. And this is different. those are different ways to write it. So you could write it the summation over all omega that are in EA. Sometimes people also write omega colon omega element EA. So you could also do that. Yeah? Or you could write it like this. But it must be clear what is the variable here. And here you see the a is coming from the other side. And the little omega is bound by the summation sign. OK? Good. Um, let's, let's come to the notation of having a comma. OK? But now with our machinery at hand, it's getting really simple to write down what we mean by a comma. So the joint probability yeah, for several formulas, a and b, for example, yeah, is just their co the probability of their conjunction. Okay, so a comma can be replaced by an and sign. Okay? And of course, we can have arbitrarily many. Good, so far so good. Any questions up to here? For everyone who's done this already in Wahrscheinlichkeitstheory or probability theory, or in this, this is just a repetition of the simplest possible case, in a way, right? Of a, case with finitely many variables where everything is nice. Question? Yes, I have, I have maybe a simple question, but what if, uh, what if our world, consists, our world Omega consists only of a formula that is false? For example, like A and not A, then, then we won't have uh, any possibility of having ah, okay. one. Good question. So let's see. Um, so let's take the, the possibly the super simplest case of having only um, a single variable. OK, so this is my curly V. It just contains of my, oh, let's, let's use x. OK, and then what are possible formulas? Let's write down some formulas. So we have x for sure. Then we have not x, we have x and x, we have x, and x, and x. And I stop here, and we have bracket x, for example. And we have also more complicated stuff, something like this, maybe. Those are all possible formulas. And now having an assignment, omega, going from this to 0, 1, I can assign a truth value to all of these. That's so far so good. So this is defining, um, oh, let's use these pretty arrow. So this is defining a function q going from the formulas. So far so good. So this is our world, right? Now, there is an assignment which gives it true, and there's another assignment which gives it false. And so if in your world um, the x is true for sure, yeah, then probably you would say my p of, uh, let me write it like this now. I'm already, hmm, do I like it? Now let's do it like this. p of this one will be equal to 1. And the p of not x will be equal to that. So that's OK. But up to here, we haven't decided. We haven't looked at reality. But then when we look at reality, we will start with some assignment. And it could be either or. It's not excluding. Does it approximately answer your question? Definitely. OK, very good. Um, by the way, that was in why I like such a question now is because like, it um, pushed me to give a simple example, maybe, which clarifies the whole thing. So sometimes just ask a question, even if you think, ah, I didn't understand enough to have a brilliant question here, right? But um, that's no problem. Sometimes it's triggering interesting examples. OK, good. So basically, the um, definition of the language, of the syntax, and of the semantics, and all these things, they don't fix any reality or something. So let's flip back. So what is fixing the reality? Basically, the choice of the probability mass function. Yeah? So this is kind of representing what you think about the world. And then you can use this calculus to do all computations and to calculate different things. Good, so far so good. Um, luckily, the definition up to here fulfills Kolmogorov axioms. Okay? So I think Kolmogorov axioms are only the first three. 
Yeah, so the first one, let's check whether this is true. P of A is between 0 and 1. So let's see why this is the case. I show you why. Because the P of A is the, the summation of all the f of omegas which make A true. So it's a summation of lots of f of omegas. And we know that if we sum them up all, all of them, yeah, so they will be equal to 1. And we know that the f of omega for each of them is greater or equal than 0. So the summation of a subset of them must be, must be between 0 and 1. Okay, so that is the first statement. Let's take the second statement. p of omega is equal to 1. Let's check that. Where is that one? So that's basically, first of all, p of omega. Yeah, it is in a way not a formula, but it's more an event. So the omega is an event set. So we have to use this formula up here. So we basically sum up all omega and capital omega. And then by our definition, we require that the summation is equal to 1. OK? So far, so good. By the way, when you see it's the first way, as I presented, some of the things that I require look arbitrary. right? The whole point of everything was to get Kolmogorov's axioms. OK? If I don't get Kolmogorov's axioms, I need to go back to the definition and fiddle around a little bit with it. OK? That's just how it is. But then when you present it, you present it like in the wrong ordering, which might be confusing sometimes for the listener. Now, this is a more interesting thing now. So we have two formulas, A, B, and the formula is A or B. And we say that the event sets are disjoint. OK, so they, that's basically the um, Kolmogorov's, uh, part of Kolmogorov's axioms. And then we want that the probability of A or B is just the summation. By the way, the or sign looks very much like the union sign, right? And that's not by chance. The same holds for the and sign. It looks very much like the intersection sign. So they really correspond to each other. And here, basically, the same. Let's look what's happening. So the proof of 3 is that I can rewrite it, basically, as a summation over all omegas that are in this event set for this E, A, or B. And then I know that, basically, the intersection is empty. So um, this set E sub A or B is basically E sub A combined with union with E sub B. And since these sums are all finite, everything is nice, I can move the omegas that are in E sub A into the first sum and the omegas that are in E sub B into the second sum. Okay? So here's everything okay. Nothing with sigma additivity or some other things that would uh, give us headaches. Okay? So everything is nice. Good. And then I just can rewrite it again as P of A and P of B. And that's the proof. Okay? So for the second equality, this one here, we needed basically the assumption that they are disjoint. Okay? Good. What about the other ones? The other ones, they just follow from Kolmogorov axiom. So if you have the first three, you can somehow derive the other ones yeah, with some simple tricks. You might not even have to go again into this notation here. I think you can directly prove those, OK? Which is nice. And now we can throw away our letter and forget about syntax and semantics. Yeah? But sometimes maybe you want to get back to something like this. By the way, why is finite already quite a bit? Suppose you are doing uh, whatever Bundesliga um, betting or something. Typically, you have only finitely many events there, right? There are only finitely many games, there are only finitely many teams, and so on and so forth. So for many application, uh, application setups, you only have finitely many variables, OK? So that's totally OK. However, everything gets weird once we get to real-valued random variables, right? Then suddenly you have overcountably many possibilities, and everything gets more complicated. We will give you, I will give you a hand-wavy way how to define it based on this definition, but I think it will uh, be on Wednesday that I tell you. Good, so far so good. Um, what about conditional probability? We haven't talked about it. We just following Kolmogorov and we just define it, okay? We just say that if p of b is greater than zero, yeah, so if p of b, if b is possible, kind of, then we define p of a given b like this quotient. Okay, so basically renormalizing the probability of A yeah, with respect to P of B. By the way, at, the, at my very first lecture a couple of years ago, I was suggesting how about defining P of A given B 
equal to one if p of b is equal to zero, right? It's kind of uh, unfortunate that we don't define this quotient or this p of a given b if p of b is equal to zero. Couldn't we also define it somehow, right? So that was my suggestion because it looks a bit like ex falso quod libet, yeah? This is the last Latin phrase I'm using in this lecture probably for the, for the rest of the semester. So basically it says, if you have something wrong, like p of b is equal to zero, anything follows, okay? Um, and I thought this is a great idea. However, is it a great idea? Any suggestions? So I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out, but one of my students figured it out and he says, no, this is a really, really bad idea because when you combine it with the sum rule, then P of A given B plus P of not A given B suddenly equal to two, okay? Which is bogus, okay? So we better not define anything for P of B being equal to zero, okay? We don't say what it is, okay? And we are not allowed to use it. So when you have a conditional probability, it's only defined yeah, for the case that the condition is really greater than zero, okay? So that's very, very often you need to check it, yeah, that this is really greater than zero. Good. Um, so furthermore, so I said here something about Kolmogorov's axioms, but this was all without conditioning on something. Of course, now it would be nice if this new definition that I have here also fulfills Kolmogorov axioms, and it does, okay? Of course, you would have to prove that, okay? You should show this first three things from the last slide, and you have to show that this P of A given B defined like that is also fulfilling Kolmogorov's axioms, okay? Maybe let's have a quick look whether it's easy or not. So it needs to be zero between zero and one, okay? So this is A and B, and this is B. So that means the probability on the top is typically smaller than the one at the bottom, because at the top you are ruling out more of these omegas, right? Because also B needs to be true, not only A, also B. So the top part is a positive number, the bottom part is a positive number, and the bottom thing is larger, greater or equal, so the whole thing will be between one, uh, less than one, okay? And it's also greater than zero because both of them are greater than zero. And so on and so forth. So what about the P of omega? Okay, let's have a look at that one. It's interesting. So it's P of omega given B, yeah, which is equal to P of omega comma B divided by P of B. So that's now getting more interesting. So for this, let's briefly think about what is this P of omega um, P of omega comma B divided by P of B. Okay, so what is this? So I said this is an N sign, however, only if those two things are formulas. So I would first need to replace this by a formula. And there is a special formula which, for example, we could use uh, A or not A. Okay, that is the formula that is always true, no matter what you assign, right? And this thing gets a special name, it's called top. Okay, this is like a T, but without the serifen. And you could also imagine there's also one which is called bottom, which is basically A and not A, or also not top. So if I replace this by a formula, I would have P of top comma B, divided by P of B, then we know that the comma is basically an and sign, okay? And then there's something top and anything is equal to anything, okay? Something that is true, is anyway true, and something else must be true, the same as that the something else must be true, okay? So we see that this thing is just P of B divided by P of B. Curious, which is equal to one, which was what we wanted to show. It was surprisingly difficult, kind of, right? Because we need to think about, so what does this now mean? This looks kind of strange, okay? Good. I hope so far so good. So that was the other Kolmogorov axiom. And then there's another one, basically that one, and it can be also done. Trust me. 
So basically, you can bracket out the p of b kind of if you condition it everywhere, okay? And then basically, you have the same statement as here, but divided by p of b. Yeah? But it can be also done. So the good thing is, so if we define the conditional probability like that, it also fulfills Kolmogorov axioms, so everything is great. Furthermore, we, by the way, we right away get Bayes theorem by applying basically this definition one-sided and the other way around. Yeah? So we can have p of a given b, and we can have a definition for p of b given a, and then by equating the joints, we have Bayes rule. Okay? So Bayes theorem is often falsely called Bayes rule just a second ago already, right? But I will continue to do so. It's not a rule, it's a theorem here, okay? But who cares, right? I mean, base rule. Good, so far so good. Then I was puzzled by the question, now what about the relationship between P of A implies B, which is the, form, the probability of a formula, and P of B given A? And I was wondering whether it's the same thing or not in this definition. Unfortunately, it's not the same thing. So the relation that you can derive here with this weird stuff, it's, I, I just wrote it down for your pleasure here, that somehow you can have a formula like p of a implies b is equal to 1 if and only if p of b given a is equal to 1. So you can derive something like this, which is already quite nice, okay, so that's cool. But in general, p of a implies b is greater or equal than p of b given a. Yeah, that's just how the stuff is defined. What it really means, I don't know, but it just reminds us it's not exactly the same thing. By the way, how is it different? Like I said that the A shouldn't be true, right? So the A, uh, the, the A must be true. It shouldn't be, have probability zero, otherwise the whole thing is undefined. The left-hand side is also defined if the A is false, right? And you know this um, thing that uh, ex falso quad libet, so last time, maybe this is the very last time of a Latin phrase, um, if here's something wrong standing, then the whole formula is true. Yeah, and as a German, I, I don't know the, the an English translate, uh, translation, um, Falls SC Freiburg Deutscher Meister wird fressigen Besen. Yeah, this phrasing, let me try to translate it. So if some team that is not supposed to become the master of the soccer teams yeah, wins and becomes a champion, I will eat an, um, a broom. Okay, so that's a German phrase. Of course, no one wants to eat brooms, so you put something at the beginning which is obviously v false, right? Which is exactly what mathematicians do when they write A implies B, and when they say this formula is true when A is false. Okay, so the first thing here has also the situation where A is false, and this thing doesn't talk about it. So the P of B given A does not talk about situations where A is false, okay? That's why they are not exactly the same. Good, so it's somehow hand wavy also what we did then with the plausible reasoning, but nice. So I liked it and it gave me at least some intuition for these probabilities, why they are useful and where they come from. Good, so the, to show all these results, basically you need to show this result here, which I show you down here. So it's just some computation with the usual rules, okay? And then the rest, all these things, two, three, four, and five, they will follow from one, yeah, by plugging stuff in and then fiddling around with it. But this was just out of curiosity. So I started with the question, what exactly do we mean by P of A, P of A, comma B? And I hope now you're happy with the answer. So events can be input. Yeah, that's maybe something that you know already from other mass lectures that these things are called events. And these events are subset of the set of all events, so of the set of all possibility. And basically P of E is the probability that event E happens. However, we can also use formulas as inputs. Yeah, so formula like E or B induces an event set, and thus we can also just define the probability of such a formula. Okay? Um, so basically, we can plug in here everything yeah, that can be either true or false. Yeah? So the p is a function that takes as an input some formula that can be true or false, which means we are not limited to propositional logic, but of course we could also put in some other stuff like for all x, f of x, or an equation like 17 is equal to 42, or something like that. And we can talk about the probabilities of these things. Yeah? Um, however, here we only defined it for propositional logic. 
And to make it more complicated, it's, get quick, it's getting quickly more and more and more complicated. So we don't do this. So short summary. So p is a function of events. Yeah, that's what it is. Thus, it's also a function of formulas, OK, since formulas induce events. So we can plug in anything that's either true or false, which sometimes gives some weird looking formulas when we say something like p of x being equal to 17, bracket close. That's like an equation inside an expression, which is weird, but it totally makes sense. Okay? In particular, for our computer scientist brain side, yeah, where we know, okay, the p, what, it has a certain type, right? So it takes a Boolean argument, kind of, right? Or an expression, maybe more precisely an expression, and it outputs a number between 0 and 1. There's nothing special about it. An equation has as an output a Boolean, right? So we can plug it in here. Good. And then there are only two important rules to memorize. So forget everything, but memorize the product rule and the sum rule. Okay, those are the rules. And you can get them from using Kolmogorov's measure theory. You can get them from Cox axioms. You can get them from this derivation that I showed you today. Okay, but those are the essential rules that must, ho must hold any way how you define it. And there are lots of variations of these rules, but those are the essentials. And the rules down here, you can always derive them from these two rules. Okay, so those are the special things. The nice thing when you think about it, one is plus and the other one is times. Question? Does it not matter? Um, do it not need any parentheses in the product rule? Like the question is, what has more parentheses? Uh, ah, sure. The Very good question. What, how, what is the stronger binding uh, power, the comma or the bar, right? Mm -hmm. So the comma has a stronger binding power. So let me write it down explicitly. So the p of also great question. So now is it p of a comma b given c or is it p of a comma b given c, right? That's your question. Yes, and we we haven't this thing is not a formula. The B given C is not a formula. So it wouldn't be defined what we mean by this, right? Because this should then be an end sign. But the B given C is not a formula. It's not coming from our inductive definition of formula. OK, so this is the only interpretation. This is a valid one, so basically an end. So the comma is binding stronger than the bar. Very important question when you want to write a parser for this stuff, right? So then you really need to fix it. So very good question. In particular, uh, now we could also think, and what about bar? Bar E, does it have a meaning or not? In a way, yes, actually. In a way, yes. We could replace this with a comma. I haven't thought about it yet, but I think this is, this is the way to do it. So basically, if I first condition on C, and then I take this distribution and I condition again on another variable, of course I can do it. It's just a renormalization, right? Then it turns into a comma. It's the same thing as like having a comma here. Do you want to see it? Oh, you trust me on this one. OK, you trust me. So it really takes the definition for conditioned on C, and then you set one and plug it again into the definition of the conditional probability and then see what you get, OK? OK. So I should include this into my slide. So that's a nice one. So the, but then it's also, a, we get back to machine learning soon. OK, so this is the end of section three, OK? Any more questions here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's let's try to write it out. Um, okay. So P of I I use comma. Okay. Is that okay? So and now. Uh, let's write down the definition. I'm just using the definition of this one. And um, 
the definition of this is a quotient p of a comma b comma c comma d divided by p of d so and where's the product rule the product rule is if i move this guy over to the other side so for this expression the product rule would be this one okay so this is gone by the way it's interesting now so what about p of a comma b given not a okay that's weird right so let's write it out it's p of a comma b comma not a divided by p of not a so we must already assume that the p of not a is greater than zero so that's an assumption that we need otherwise it doesn't make sense to write it out and then we know that this thing here is basically an and sign and so this thing on top is just probability of bottom because a and not a is always wrong divided by p of not a and this will be equal to zero because p of bottom is zero okay now there's p of top is equal to 1 minus p of bottom and since this is already equal to 1 this thing is 0 okay interesting and now we could derive it kind of from our simple propositional logic kind of definition here any more questions we can always also go back to these topics so don't worry you can always ask also questions for older stuff that's no problem good so far so good so that was section three. Let's continue with section four. Let me see how it goes. Good. So Bayesian networks. That's an interesting, nice topic. Basically now marrying graphs and probabilities. Okay. So now before we get to continuous variables like a Gaussian distribution and all these things, we continue with discrete probabilities. Okay. Because there's already so much interesting that we can do with it. So there are some computational difficulties with probability theory. That's nothing that you worry about in Wahrscheinlichkeitstheory, yeah, because there you're writing down formulas and you're happy with infinite spaces and all these things. But here already with finitely many variables, suppose you have 26 variables, things can really explode. Okay? So what can happen? So how many numbers do I need to store if I want to um, memorize the joint distribution of 26 variables basically for each of these different combinations I need to store a number okay so to describe this probability distribution for all different combinations I need to tell you what it is maybe first think about a single variable so how many do you need to store you need to store one number yeah p of a and this is defining by 1 minus p of a you also have p of not a so you need a single number if you have two variables you need to store p of a comma b p of a comma not b p of not a comma b and the last one again you get this one minus okay and so on um, here you need uh, 67 million numbers which is quite a bit right for only 26 variables where the last one again you can omit because you get it for free but you have to store all the other ones and that's requiring lots of memory and when you do some computations with it it's super expensive because you have to you have to go through the whole array often yeah so that is not very clever so is 26 variables are those maybe gigantically many no suppose you are designing like a probability distribution for uh, whatever so for um, for a medical doctor for an md okay and where she has let's say some variables of symptoms and of illnesses okay some symptom might be um, having whatever uh, having uh, like a missing leg okay so that's a symptom already quite a drastic symptom another symptom might might be that you're coughing and another symptom might be that whatever you have six fingers on your hand or whatever and then there are certain illnesses that you might have like you're having a flu or you're having whatever a broken leg and so on and so forth and those are all propositional variables each of them could be either true or false and of course it would be nice to have the joint probability distribution over all of them because then comes your patient you kind of check off all the symptoms and this is defining a probability distribution over all the illnesses 
That's super useful, right? I mean, and 26 is in a very small number. But of course, it's way too expensive to do this. However, there's some structure in your data, right? The missing leg has probably nothing to do with having a flu, right? So there's no connection. So kind of you are doubling all the numbers. You have all the numbers with the missing leg, and then there are exactly the same numbers, at least regarding coughing and having a flu, with having a leg, okay? So you're really overdoing a lot of work. So how can you structure it better? The idea is to use graphs, okay? And curiously, one can use graphs here. But before we get to the graphs, um, let's see um, how we could specify this distribution with fewer numbers. And okay, as I said, we restrict how variables are relevant to each other. Um, but before we do that, again, a little note about notation. And often, having good notation yeah, is like having defined the right classes in your programming language. Yeah? Once you have done the right pre-work, Everything gets super simple, and the same is when you write things down. So basically, writing down math is nothing else than having a different programming language, where you need to be very careful with writing things, okay? So, typically, we would write like P of A is the probability that formula A is true, and P of not A is the probability that formula A is uh, not A is true. But sometimes it's more useful to write it like this, p of a being equal to 1 or p of a being equal to 0. So now how does it fit into the stuff that we said before? So somehow the a being equal to something yeah, is also like a defining a predicate, like a, um, the, the equal sign is a function that takes two inputs, two terms, and it will output a true or a false depending on whether the value of the left-hand side and the right-hand side are the same. Yeah, so it's also some truth function that will output a true thing. And basically for every equation we could write down, yeah, basically we now introduce a new propositional variable and then everything applies that we've done before. And since we don't have enough trees, there are only finitely many equations you could write down. Okay? There are not infinitely many. So our theory applies that we introduced. So Sometimes we write it like this. A is a propositional variable, and we would write A equals to 1 if proposition A is true, and A equals to 0 if it's false. Why is it useful? Because now we could state something like this. P of A comma B is equal to P of A times P of B. Sometimes this holds if they are independent. Yeah, this will come. But um, what does it now exactly mean? It doesn't only mean it for the, for the formula A and B, but also for the formula not A and not B and all combinations. So if we use this notation here, we can distinguish the situation where we make a general statement about these random variables. I will also explain what a random variable is more precisely, but just use your intuition, what, what you know about it already. But it also applies for all possible value assignments here. So basically, this is now an abbreviation right, for these four equations. So no matter what you assign to A and B, yeah, those things will factorize. OK, so it's confusing. It's confusing me too sometimes, whether we are in this notation or whether we are in that notation. Yeah? So you always have to be careful. It can happen that in the final exam, there's one question where we use this notation and another question where we use the other notation. Yeah? If it confuses you, ask during the exam or if there's something unclear, right? But both appear in books and both appear in papers, okay? Good, so this is about notation. So now, instead of having the super complicated network with missing legs, let's use a simpler one, the sprinkler network. So this is from David Barber's book, which you could also download. So if you want to have complementary explanation of the whole thing, look into the book. That's where I took this example. So this is, for me, this is always California in my head. So they are like Tracy and Jack, and they have a nice house, and they have some nice lawn around their house, so nice and green. But California is super dry, so you wait for rain so that the lawn stays green, or you have a sprinkler, yeah, like some uh, water hose that can put water onto your grass, right? Here we typically don't do this, but if you are in a dry area and you want to have green lawn around your house, you need this. So this is the sprinkler network, we will see, but let's first talk about the variables. So one variable, either true or false, is that Tracy's grass is wet, so the lawn of Tracy's house is wet or not. Another variable is whether it rained last night. Another one is whether 
um, J, the grass of Tracy's neighbor Jack, is wet. And then there's another one, whether the sprinkler of Tracy was on last night or not, okay? And I have different, different notations for Tracy. I don't know, it probably depends on the, um, on the time of the day when I wrote this up. Sometimes I use EY and sometimes I use Y. It's always the same Tracy, there's only one Tracy. So don't get confused by that one. So those are four variables now. And now from our world knowledge, we kind of know how things work, right? We know that if it's raining, Tracy's grass will be wet and also Jack's grass will be wet. If the sprinkler is on, yeah, on Tracy's lawn, then only Tracy's lawn gets wet, and not the one of Jack, okay? However, if we don't know this world knowledge, first we can just write down the joint probability distribution, which has these um, four variables here now. And again, here I'm using the notation t equals 1 or t equals 0. So this is written down very general for all possibilities. And we can use the product rule. So applying the product rule with respect to s, we get the first expression. And then we can apply the product rule to the first factor here to factor it into two pieces. And then the first piece can be also factored. Now what's nice about this one, it's like a probability distribution of only a single variable conditioned on the other variables, okay? So it's, it's kind of a simple way to write things down. So basically we applied three times the product rule. Let's count the number of parameters. So how many parameters do we need? So the last one here has one parameter, only p of s being equal to one we need to store, the other one we get for free. For the p of r being equal to one, we need to store two numbers because we need to store a number for s being equal to one and we need to store a number for s being equal to zero, okay? And then there's the other way around, p of r being equal to zero, yeah, we get with one minus the corresponding number. Now what about if we condition on two variables? Basically then there are four cases that we need to cover. So for this one we need to store four numbers, okay? And for that one we need to store eight numbers because there are eight possibilities for the conditions to be true or false. And then we need to store a single number for t being equal to one. Okay, so at the end we will have 15 parameters. Eight plus four plus two plus one. Of course, the other reasoning would be we have four bits, okay, how many possibilities are there? 16, and we get one for free because one minus all the others, okay? So that's another way. So you could either look on the left-hand side and you would count 15 parameters, or you look on the right-hand side and you count the parameters of the different factors, okay? And it's the same. So far, so good. Let's leave out irrelevant conditions. And by this now we are using our world knowledge. So whether the sprinkler is on or not, it's not conditioned on anything, okay? It's a single number anyway. What about the p of r given s? Those variables are independent of each other, okay? Uh, of course, it depends on the, on the home automation that um, Tracy has, right? So maybe it can detect the rain or the weather forecast or something, but let's assume it's not. The sprinkler is kind of programmed, like in certain months it's switched on and in other months it's not switched off, it, it's switched off and it's independent of um, whether it has rained or not. In particularly, raining is independent of the sprinkler, so we can omit it. So what do I mean by omitting here? So we have a certain probability that it rains, given that the sprinkler was on, and we have a certain probability that it rains, given that the sprinkler is off. And if, from our world knowledge, those two things have nothing to do with each other, they are exactly the same numbers, okay? So I don't need to condition on the S because I'm anyway using the same probability for P of R, no matter whether the sprinkler was on or not, okay? So that means I leave out an irrelevant condition here. So the same here, what about the lawn of Jack? Whether the sprinkler is on on Tracy's side is irrelevant for J, okay? That's why I can leave off the S here, yeah? Same reasoning. I would assign the same numbers anyway, okay, for s equals 1 and s equals 0. So I can also omit it. Similarly here now for Tracy, kind of, if I know that it has rained and or that the sprinkler was on and off, yeah, it's irrelevant what's with Jack's grass going on. So if I don't know r and s, of course, the wetness of Jack's grass tells me something about Tracy's graph, or the other way around. The wetness of no, that was correct. So the wetness of Jack's graph 
grass tells me something about Tracy's grass if I don't know anything, but if I know that it was raining, yeah, I don't care whether the, he has covered his, uh, his lawn with some wood for a party or something, whether it's really wet or not. It only is re required to know whether it has rained or not and whether my sprinkler was on or not, okay? So, in a way, this jack variable here is also irrelevant here, so I can also omit it. Again, let's do the parameter counting. So, if I have only this, I have one parameter. The p of r also has only one parameter. The p of j given r has two parameters because there are two possibilities, either rain or not rain. And the first one here has four parameters because there are four combinations of the conditions. So, suddenly I only have eight parameters, which is a big reduction. And you can imagine if you have 26 of them and you know that missing legs have nothing to do with flus, yeah, there are many conditions that you can also leave out for the medical doctor. Okay? So great. So it looks like this is super useful. Let's represent it graphically. So basically, I can now have for every variable here, I make a node in a graph and I make a connection if a node is a condition on the other node. So S does not have any condition, so it doesn't have any incoming edges. The J is influenced by the rain, so I have a connection from R to J, okay? The T is influenced by the rain and the sprinkler, so I have these two things. So in a way now, this is a graphical representation of my world knowledge. It doesn't express yet the probabilities, but kind of the mechanisms, okay? When it rains, Jack's and Tracy's lawn gets wet. If the sprinkler is on, on Tracy's side, Tracy's side gets wet, okay? So this is like a description. And curiously, also, the more edges I have in here, like the more conditions I will up, have up here, right? So you could also draw the graph for all the conditions that you get from the product rules, and then you would have a fully connected graph. Let's also assign numbers here, okay? And again, those numbers are as arbitrary as your beliefs in monsters and mice, okay? So those are just your numbers from your world knowledge from living in California. I don't know whether you've done already. So if you do, you will have certain numbers here. For example, the probability that it rains is 20%. Probably that's an exaggeration. If you lived in California, it would be more like 2% or something, I guess. At least that's how it felt. Then the probability of switching on the sprinkler here in this example is 0.1, okay, for whatever reason. Maybe the water is scarce and so you don't do it so often. Next, the probability that Jack's lawn is wet when, this, when it has rained is equal to 1, for sure it will be wet, okay? He never has parties and never covers his grass with wood. And then there's also the probability when it's um, not raining, it's 0 0.2. Hmm, why is that? Maybe because Jack also has a sprinkler, which is not modeled in our network here, okay? Then there's this probability that Tracy's grass is wet for all the different possibilities that we have here. By the way, here now you see the beauty of having these equations inside the brackets. So it's super useful to distinguish these cases, okay? So, kind of, if it's raining or if the sprinkler is on, kind of the probabilities are very large. Maybe the sprinkler is sometimes broken or something and sometimes it's stuck at one location, whatever, and then the lawn is not getting wet, and so on and so forth. So you can make up a story. Of course, I'm not making up the story fitting the numbers. Typically, you have the story from your domain expert or from yourself, and you make up the numbers, okay? Good, and this is now a full description of the, pro of the joint probability distribution. So the graph is telling me what factorization am I using, okay? So the graph is telling me in what order did I apply the product rules and which variables did I omit, okay? And then these numbers here, they tell me basically the, um, they have a single number for the P of S, a single number for the P of R, and two numbers for the P of J, and four numbers for the P of T. Okay, so they are the conditional probability tables in this case. Why are they called tables? Because we have only discrete, so countably many values, possible values here for my variables. We have only true and false. Good, so far so good. What can we do with it? We can use it now for probabilistic inference. So we could ask the question, what is the probability that the sprinkler was on, given that we observe that Tracy's grass is wet? Okay, so this is like a real language statement, and we can translate it into the probability of S being equal to 1, 
given that t is equal to 1. Um, so let's just recall, so the sprinkler is wetting Tracy's grass directly, we apply the formula, and now we would need to calculate the p of s, comma t, and we need to calculate the p of t. So we are very lazy, yeah? we just use the sum rule because we always want to do the same calculations. So we do it the following, we add all the missing variables and sum them out right away. Okay, so basically we sum out the capital J, the capital R, okay, and just plug it in here. If you preferred, you could also write it differently, um, like this. I for forgot now what the exact letters were. So maybe I'm now having a different example, but let's say I'm interested in, in this one, okay? Then the notation that I just used was I'm summing out the other variables. Oh, and let's make it, so this is like with some assigned values, p of j being equal to 1, t being equal to 0, and r and s. So that's the notation I'm using on the slide, but Sometimes we're also using small letters for values, okay? And we could also write maybe a more familiar notation, r, s, j being equal to 1, t being equal to 0, capital R being equal to little r. This is a notation that is very common, using little letters for the value, capital letters for the random variables, something like this, okay? Or you could also say the R is element in 0, 1, and the S is element in 0, 1. Okay, so these are all different ways to write it down. Important is you should know this is the meaning down here, and then you will use this notation because it's more convenient. Okay? Good. So what, what does it buy me if I have this joint distribution of all of them? Then now I can use my factorization that I get from my graph, where I now can plug in the right numbers and I can do the computation. Okay, so I have a formula for the joint distribution along the graph, basically, yeah, following the direction of the arrows, and I have the proper numbers. By the way, of course, this CPT, this is like a little table with one entry, I could put it here if I would be better at late taking slides. I would make a little table up here. And the table for t down here, I would make a little table down here, which is a bit larger because I need to go through all combinations of the incoming arrows. Okay? Good. And I can compute it 0 0.33. That's already something, right? Because it turned my knowledge, my world knowledge of observations, right? It turned it into a very non trivial statement. And in a way, so this is now, this could be a relevant finding, right? It could be the probability that the person with a missing leg has a flu, okay? So it could be something super useful, yeah? Good, let's calculate something else. Let's say, additionally, to knowing that Tracy's grass is wet, um, we also observe that Jack's grass is also wet, okay? Interesting, right? So we were interested in the probability that the sprinkler is on, and we know if Tracy's grass is wet, of course, there's some probability that it was uh, the cause of the wet grass. However, if I also know additionally that Jack's grass is wet, then probably it rained, right? Because both are wet. So the probability of the sprinkler being on should go down. So somehow this information, j being equal to 1, is explaining away the explanation that we had. And if you go through the math, it turns out the probability is going down. Okay? So that is a very nice feature of this calculus that I showed you here. And this is not a feature of some of the other approaches to reasoning under uncertainty that we've seen last time. I, I showed you very briefly like a slide on um, non-monotonic reasoning, this kind of logicist approaches to uncertainty, and the non-monotonicity is exactly the puzzling thing here. So somehow we have more information and it doesn't lead to more theorems, so to becoming everything becoming more likely, 
but it suddenly explains away something. So the, the truth goes down a bit, okay? And that is a very important feature that many of the other approaches for reasoning under uncertainty don't have, but the probabilities have it. That's why I think this is the only way to do it, okay? However, maybe I'm not an expert in the other approaches. So, it's explaining a way that the sprinkler is the reason for the wet grass of Tracy, okay? So that's kind of interesting. There are some other things. So this is another notation meaning S and J are independent and I will introduce it in a minute. Yeah. So S and J are independent. So what does it mean? So Jack's grass being wet is independent of the sprinkler being on or not, right? Because the sprinkler is Tracy's sprinkler, not Jack's sprinkler. However, if I observe that Tracy's grass is wet, suddenly those two variables are coupled. Right? So if they wouldn't be coupled, I would have had exactly the same numbers here. But suddenly, if I know that Tracy's grass is wet, yeah, then suddenly the sprinkler and Jack's grass, they are coupled with each other. Yeah? That's a very interesting effect, which happens in reality, right? So this is um, surprising that it comes out of this, but this is when you think about it, how reality really is. Good. Now, I did now sh show you an example of probabilistic reasoning. Let's write down the steps that you need to perform to do this, like so that you really mechanically can do this. So you identify all relevant variables. In this case, it was tj, r, and s. Then you define the joint probability distribution, and you do it in a clever way with giving a graph and writing down the CPTs. Then you have some evidence. Yeah, This is re really like Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, you have some evidence about some things. You observe something, like the sprinkler is on, for example, or Jack's grass is wet, for example. That's the evidence. And this fixes the value of certain variables. Okay, in the example, it was t equals 1, so Tracy's grass was wet. That is the evidence that Sherlock Holmes has seen. And then comes this inference. And then he infers the probability distribution of certain variables. And for this, it's typically required to integrate out the rest. So what does integrating out mean? Integration is basically the same as summation. So you sum out the other variables. So that is the formal description. The semantic, or the more like Sherlock Holmes description would be kind of you average out all other possibilities. So there might be some other things like there are birds flying or there is a cloud or something. That is not ir irrelevant. I want to sum out all of those possibilities. So I'm summing out all the variables which are not relevant for my question that I have. Okay? That's the integrating out the rest. And then I can calculate basically this. So let's switch back whether this was how we did it. We just translated some English question into a probability statement. We applied the definition of the conditional probability. Then we used the summation rule to have the summation over joint distributions. And we calculated the quotient. That's it. Yeah, and you can imagine this can be mechanized, right? So this can be done very mechanical. Very good. So this thing also deserves a name. So one definition is the Bayesian network definition from Barber. And I think also Pearl is using it in his 1988 book. And the definition is one that I don't like very much. But since you sometimes see it, I want to show you. And I show you what I dislike about it. And so here it is. A Bayesian network is a distribution that can be written as a factorized product where I'm having here certain parent sets. Okay? So there are the so-called parental variables. Um, and a Bayesian network can be represented as a directed acyclic graph with the propositional variables as nodes and arrows from parents. So being a Bayesian network here is a property of a distribution. However, what I don't like about it a single distribution could have several graphs assigned to it, right? And I show you in a minute what I mean by this. Here, this distribution, p of x1, x2, could be factorized like that. It could be also factorized the other way around, right? I can apply the, the product rule first with, on the one variable or the other variable. However, in both cases, I would say there is a factorization for p of x1, x2. So p of x1, x2 is a Bayesian network. However, there are two networks. One where the error is coming from x1 to x2, and one where it's going from x2 to x1. That's why I do not like so much this definition. Nonetheless, we know what they mean, right? We know 
why they write it like this maybe. But there's a better way to write it, so we don't use it. Here's another one from Peter's book, Jonas Peter's book on causality. He's using a, a different definition. So he says a Bayesian network is a DAG G. So there's a graph, and this graph is a Bayesian network with these vertices x1 and x2 and with some conditional probability distributions. So those are the CPTs where this notation is now a bit overly precise, but it basically says that the j's variables has parents in graph g. And the graph g was the one that we are talking about. That's it basically, okay? Good. Um, and those probabilities are also sometimes called the conditional probability tables, the CPTs. That's something, sometimes you see this when you talk about discrete variables. So, and um, that's another way to define it. So for me, a Bayesian network is a particular given graph with probability distributions, so with CPTs on it. So that's a Bayesian network. Um, by the way, just as a side note, of course, since those are conditional probabilities, they need to sum up to one. Sometimes you have to require this. Sometimes it's obvious since we are saying that this is conditional probabilities. So now if I have a Bayesian network, then this will induce a joint distribution. So given such a graph with these CPTs, I can multiply all of them and this is defining me a joint distribution. And I prefer this definition because I can have two different graphs, yeah, and then inducing the same distribution. And then those are two different networks for me in my head, okay? Good, so far so good, but those are just definitions. Um, here's another note, by the way, I can apply the product rule to my variables x1 to xn and I can do it in a particular, particular ordering, right? So it could start with x1 and then condition on nothing and then x2 condition on x1 and x3 condition on x1 and x2 and I can also do it for any other permutation of my variables. So I can also have a different ordering and start with x17 and condition on nothing and then I go on. Just a second. Um, so any permutation is giving me a different factorization here, okay? So curiously, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the DAGs and the factorizations and the permutations, right? How many permutations are there? I forgot, maybe factorial n or something, I guess. So that's the number of permutations. And there's exactly the same number of DAGs for n variables and there's the same number of factorizations. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. So with other words, a Bayesian network is specifying a particular factorization of your joint distribution. And there could be different factorizations corresponding to different graphs. Okay, so um, any fully connected DAG, of course, is also a Bayesian network, but not a super efficient one, right? So you still need as many parameters as before. Question. Um, the index variable under the product is i, but in the formula is, is j. Is Thank that you. Okay. That's a mistake. Can you post it on Rocket Chat? Right. Then I sit at home and I have nothing to do, and, or I have something to do, and I want to kill time with reading Rocket Chat, and then I see it, and I have something better to do. Okay? Okay, great. Here's another one. Yeah, so twice. Okay, very good. Okay, so. Um, if I don't leave out any arrows, like in my initial factorization, I would get the fully connected graph. So any distribution can be written as a fully connected Bayesian network, okay? So then there's nothing saved. However, if I leave out arrows from my world knowledge, because I know how the world works, yeah, then I have a more efficient um, distribution here. Now the question is, how can we characterize those constraints? How can we do it more mathematical? And we have 10 more minutes, and I wanted to show you some coding as well. So I give you a very brief preview. It will be about independence. So it was already in my speaking, right, that the sprinkler of Tracy is independent of the lawn of Jack, or the missing leg is independent kind of of the flu. And you can also have it more complicated with conditional independence. So in some situations, it only factorizes if you condition on other variables. And this is what will be expressed in these graphs. And there will be a complicated criterion next time, yeah, which is defined on graphs. So this is a so-called deseparation criterion, okay? 
and it's a bit painful. It's like a for all there exists statement, so a bit complicated, yeah? And we will go through it. And this is defining a criterion on graph. So given a graph with edges, you say these variables are deseparated from other variables given some other variables, and curiously, this corresponds exactly to the conditional independencies in the joint distribution. So the joint distribution has certain properties, and they can be found just by looking at the graph. Okay, so that's pretty cool. So that's Bayesian networks. But we will do it next time. You might already, as a preparation for next lecture, have a look at this definition already. It's a bit cumbersome because first I define what a path is. I not even define it, but then I say what it means that it's blocked. It means that there is a node, so there's an existential quantification, and then two subsets of vertices are deseparated if for every path a path is blocked. So it's a for all statement with an existential statement. So it's a bit complicated. It's like for all n there exists an i like a limit statement or these kind of things. So same complicatedness. Not more difficult but a bit cumbersome. We will look at it next time. So before I talk about this independence here let me show you these computations again, and I try to implement them in a notebook. Just a second. So these computations I want to get to, okay? So how could we kind of automate it? Ideally, we would have now classes for all of this and make it super nice interface. I, I try to um, be somewhere in between. I want to have some flexibility, but specific for this sprinkler network. So I show you my code. So this is my code. What do I need? I only need my function rand. I need it to have a coin flip. And now here, I'm using a different notation now to define a function. I like lambda as well. So this is like an anonymous way to define a function. So the, the right hand side here is defining a function. If you are confused by this, this is the same as saying flip theta return rand n less than theta. Okay? But it's saying the same thing in one line. Okay? That just is. If you don't understand it, you should learn about it. It's super useful to write things like this. Let's execute it. Ah, yeah, basically, it's saying it's a lambda x, so it's a function in theta, and the expression that is evaluated is whether a random rand n is less than theta or not. Okay, and this expression is evaluated and it, trans it translates into true or false, and that is returned. Okay, so that is this lambda notation. Okay, let's write down our sprinkler network. First of all, I need to write down my CPTs. So again, I'm using the same notation like last time. So underscore, and then comes the variables on the left-hand side of the condition bar, and then comes an underscore, and then the variables on the right-hand side of my conditioning, okay? So P of T being equal to 1 is like a T1 here on the left-hand side. Conditioned on R being equal to 1 and S being equal to 0 is like R1 S0. And then I can write down all these numbers and I can play around with it. And of course, you could, you could make a more sophisticated class or a toolbox, right? So this is like, it's getting more complicated in a second. And that's why maybe it's good first to have a simple example like that. Good. Then what is the function to sample from it? So let me execute it. So this is a sampling function. What does sampling mean? Sampling means I'm now generating a reality, okay? So I'm instantiating all the variables that are defined. So I'm sampling a situation where all these four variables have some truth values. So for this, I first flip a coin for r, and as a parameter, I'm now using p of r being equal to 1, okay? And with that probability, I flip a coin, similarly for s, and then conditioned on r, I need to flip the coin for j. So if r is true, then j is the coin flip where I have the r1. If r is false, then I use the parameter for r being equal to 0. Okay, so far so good. So now for the, two, I, for the t, I have four cases. I need to check whether r and s is both true. Then I will use the conditioning r1, s1, and so on and so forth, all other possibilities. And then I'm just returning the thing. So that is my sampler. And to have something more readable, if I have an assignment to all these variables, I'm now generating a nice sentence, okay? And here comes again some, some Python Kung Fu, yeah? So you can have an expression like this. This is like an if then else as an expression. So the value of this expression is rain if R is true, 
and it will be no rain if r is false. Okay, that's also some Python voodoo expression thing. And by this, I'm kind of building a nice string for my variables, which is very readable. And then I can just sample from it. Here's another super cool trick. So sample is returning like this tuple of things and I can input it into the string function by putting a star in front. It's like unpacking the tuple into inputs for the string. It's also quite nice. So let me execute it. And then you get like here these samples. And the samples, they are very readable, right? At first it looks like, oh, what a waste of time to generate the strings. But once you have a for loop and you generate all of these, it's so nice. So you really see, yeah, is this the world I'm living in? Yeah, usually Tracy's lawn is not wet and my lawn is not wet. And yeah, that's just how reality is, maybe. Okay, good. So that is the first thing. I show you if you're already bored. So at the end, we want to calculate the probability of s being equal to 1 given that t is being equal to 1. And I'm doing it with this function here, which is quite nice because I can also give it other inputs, okay? So stay tuned. So where are we? We are here. So first we start with calculating the joint probability distribution. So let's have a formula for that. And I have a, want to have a formula that gets the values of r, s, j, and t. And then it calculates the joint probability distribution. And it does it along the graph. Okay? So we start with 1.0. And then we multiply it with, again, with such a weird expression. If r is true, we multiply it with p of r being equal to 1. If r is false, we multiply it with 1 minus p of r being equal to 1. Okay? And then we continue for the s. And we do basically the same thing. Now again, we have a case distinction for the value of r. In one case, we are using p of j being equal to 1, given that r is equal to 1. In the other case, we are taking r being equal to 0. And depending on whether j is actually true or false, right, that's the input, we have to use the 1 minus of that value. Similar, again, for the t variables, I have four different cases that I need to distinguish, right? And actually, I found it quite useful to implement it myself because it made it really clear why you need four cases to sample and why you need four cases to calculate the joint probability distribution for the variable t, right? Why do you need all these numbers? Here we needed them, all of them. Okay, and then there are some, um, some statements that should, should be true. This is just test code, okay? And it's a good idea to do it. I first should, yeah, I show some test code that's so educational, right, to show people that they should use test code, and then I had bugs. And I found them only because I had the test code. So it was already useful to me. So you should also do this. So what did I write here? So I have a particular assignment here, and I know by heart what this should be the probability, right? So if I have a bug in here, maybe some, some stupid bug like this or something, right, then my um, test code will yell at me. Oh, this bug is not cut, kept. Uh, this is not <laughs> captured. Okay, bad example. So I need more test code, I see. Okay, but you, you, see, you see my point. Oh, it's already over, so let me speed up. So, and again, I can calculate some joint probabilities of some randomly generated examples. Great. Let's go on with the marginal probability function. So how do I compute that one? I have all the variables, and I'm using named variables here in Python, and I've sign, I'm assigning them a default value of none. So I can omit them, and maybe just have marginal probability of r being equal to true. And that basically means I integrate out all the others. So that means if a variable is none, yeah, I'm not using the value that is given, but I'm using the set true and false. If it's not none, I'm using the set that contains the given value, okay? And then I'm just having for loops summing out all possibilities. And in some cases, when I'm giving a parameter here, basically it's a singleton. Yeah, the list has only length one, and I have only one iteration of the for loops. And basically now I'm just summing up the probabilities. So here you need to start with 0, 0. .0. And then you add the joint probabilities of the different possibilities, okay? Just like the code. Again, I have some test code, hopefully it runs. So one test code is, um, if I don't put anything, it should be one, right? So that's important. And uh, the other thing is, if I, for some random 
flipped variables here, I could calculate the marginal probability distribution and I can compare it with the joint probability distribution and it should have the same value. If that's not the case, I made a mistake, okay? And looks like there's no bug in here. So finally, I'm calculating the conditional probability and for this I invented this notation of having the variables on the left hand side are just the variables and the variables on the right hand side which I want to condition on are called R cond, S cond, J cond, T cond. Okay? And again, you can arbitrarily put stuff in and it should do the right thing. Now, how does the formula look like? I need to calculate a joint distribution of all variables div divided by the, pro the joint distribution of only the conditioned ones. And for that, this is the first thing, the denominator is super simple. It's just this marginal distribution of these conditional variables. And if some of them have none, yeah, that's fine. Yeah? So the marginal prop will deal with that. Um, the other thing is now a bit more complicated. And that's maybe something to look at at home. Yeah? I need to have different cases. It could happen that I have R being equal to true and R cont being equal to true. What does it mean? If they are the same, yeah, I should immediately return, I, I can basically omit one of them. So that's basically what you get from going through the definitions. They could have different values, in which case the whole probability gets zero, or only one is given, or only the other one is given. Okay, and by this I get the R nom, the R for the nominator. And then finally, so I'm calculating the nominator marginal probability of these guys, and I return the division. Again, there's some test code, that this conditional probability should be equal to the marginal probability and for example this one should be zero hopefully this works and then we come to the example from the lecture you just plug it in and you get the numbers and that's really nice because I did it by hand like six years ago these numbers and I wrote the code yesterday and I got the same number so it, at least I was very happy about it because otherwise I would have spent couple of more hours on writing this code here. Good, so far so good. So this was the code example. Next time we will go on and I will give you an introduction to this deseparation stuff and I guess we continue with continuous variables. Okay, you can already have a preview of the slides in the public folder. Thanks for your attention. See you on Wednesday.